Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for uh, uh, coming here to this talk, and uh, thank you for joining us in the conference. Uh, the talk today is about uh, continuous delivery at cloud, cloud scale. Um, started off being a talk about uh, building CD pipelines and all the stuff that we've been working on with Docker. You've heard uh, Kosuke mention that today in the keynote. Um, so the way the talk's set up is we'll talk about CD pipelines. We'll demo stuff um, on, on that. A very quick intro on Docker, if you haven't heard about it. And uh, we'll get into the Jenkins and Docker work. And then we'll talk about operating Jenkins at scale. And we'll talk about the Jenkins, CloudBees Jenkins platform and uh, the Jenkins as a service, we'll preview the Jenkins as a service that we are internally working on, codenamed Tiger, for lack of, uh, because I don't want to get into branding discussions yet. That's for my CEOs sitting in the first row. Uh, so, uh, you know, th there have been these internet memes that go have gone around that introduce people in terms of how they think of themselves uh, at work and how others think of themselves at work, so I thought uh, you've heard so much about Kosuke, uh, we'll take a different take on it. So if you were at the keynote, you kind of walked away with he's a CTO of CloudBees, programmer extraordinaire, favorite weapon of cho choice is an IDE, goes in, whips out codes, and delivers that. Uh, but I happen to sit next to him, and I, I don't think he sees himself that way. So I think he thinks himself of himself as a slide boy for marketing. His actual weapon is, is PowerPoint. And he's uh, usually building out slides for user conferences all around the world. You want to take a shot at me? Yes. Now, so what we have, who we have here is the Hapri Singh, the VP of Product Management. And uh, you know, he, he tells us, he has this knack of telling us what to do. Sometimes I wonder if he, he possesses some kind of Jedi trick to make, make me actually want what he wants. <laughs> so um, that's not quite right. Uh, the way I actually see myself, A, I see myself as a hustler for sales guys, and I hope there's some sales guys here. Uh, who know I'm on their side, but I have my actual weapon is the clasping hand technique, and Kosuke has seen that quite often. He at least sees that a couple of times a week, uh, asking engineering to deliver some features. Anyways, uh, uh, jokes apart, uh, we work for CloudBees, and if you haven't heard about us, uh, we are the enterprise Jenkins company. Uh, we are le you know leaders for continuous delivery. Some of the stuff that you've heard about workflow, et cetera, came in uh, from us a, in the community. We work with the community with that, around that. And uh, uh, the way we sort of go about helping organizations is uh, through a couple of products. So there's uh, the CloudBees Jenkins platform. Uh, that's CloudBees Jenkins Enterprise and Operations Center. We'll get into that uh, later in the talk. And there's Jenkins as a service um, that, that we run uh, in the cloud. And we do a number of other stuff. So as part of this, you get support. And we support all open source plugins in, and ours. Uh, we've just started professional services. Um, and uh, we do training. And if you haven't signed up for a newsletter, uh, now is probably the good time to sign up for the newsletter. Uh, an interesting bit of trivia uh, about us has been that um, a few years ago where the Hudson-Jenkins split happened, uh, we uh, actually proposed that we should have a Jenkins user conference to bring together the community so that people get to know each other face to face. That's how the user conference got started, and now here we are in four, four cities in uh, uh, multiple countries. Uh, our products are sort of used by, here's a, a smattering of the customers who are using our enterprise products um, uh, from the leading edge guys like Netflix to banks like American Express uh, and everybody out here. So um, uh, we've been doing the enterprise uh, Jenkins business for, for a while now. So with the intros out of the way, uh, what I wanted to talk about next is, um, is uh, continuous delivery. And uh, you've heard uh, this axiom by Mark Anderson who talks about software is eating the world. And uh, unless you're living under the rock, you, you, you really know software is indeed eating the world. Uh, but what I have started, what we started seeing a couple of years back is as CEOs started thinking of software delivery as the competitive edge or their, you know, or their co uh, competition, they, they go down to their CTOs, uh, their VP of engineering, and ask them how can they deliver software faster. Right, and at a pithy level, at a top level, it's really about 
getting the dev team to push their code out, and it's about automate, automating the processes and pushing that out into production. Um, but, but there's more than that, right? So Kosuke hinted towards this, and the CD summit that's happening in parallel you know, focuses on this. It's more than code. It's, it's about cultural changes, because uh, you know, who of you know the, these two guys, right? So there's, there's a dev team, and there's the ops team, and they completely they talk different languages. Right? One is being incentivized to be on the leading edge, go and break stuff, try out new things, while the ops guy is there to reduce risk and minimize things. So as, as Kosuke hinted, uh, A, you know, it's, it's hard to get these people to talk together. But um, it's not about a team building exercise. It actually uh, ends up being uh, a little more substantial than that. Um, and, and that sort of uh, substantialness exists in uh, automating stuff, right? It's about, it's, it's about taking what the car industry did with Lean a few years ago and bringing that into software. So that's, that's continuous delivery, right? And uh, once you start automating stuff, you finally get to places uh, which you could never have gone before. So my favorite use case has been of Tesla. Um, and the use case you know, actually starts off somewhat uh, uh, in a not a good story, where, uh, where Tesla, a few years back, um, had, a, had a fire. It caught fire, and uh, there was a lot of negative propaganda about it. And when they analyzed the logs being sent by the car, which they can do now, uh, they found that the car suspension was too low. So if they just raised the car suspension by six inches, things should be OK. Now, they did more than that. But if you were a car owner, Tesla car owner, you came in in the morning, uh, you had a software update on your car last night, you started the car, and the car actually rose six inches. Now, that's competitive advantage, right? Think about Ford trying to do uh, raise suspension by six inches. This is like million dollars of recall. So that's the kind of stuff that you know, him and me live and breathe. That's the stuff that gets us exciting. And the automation that we talked about earlier, that's, make, that's what makes it possible. And that's where Jenkins comes into play, right? Uh, we've talked about workflow. But now let's take the CEO, and he talks to the VP of engineering. As he goes down, uh, the engineering manager comes back and says, like, yeah, we, we do CD. We may not be doing it all the way. We, have, we are doing CI. It's commit, build, test. Uh, we are doing all those steps. What we need to do is actually just take it all the way and uh, you know, take it all the way to, uh, to production. And we need to stage things. And that's where workflow starts coming in, because it now provides that language between the dev and the ops guys, because they can look at these scripts. They can push this into the code, uh, in, in, into your soft you know, uh, source code repository and, and uh, uh, build CD as code. So uh, we've, we've had a workflow session, but very quickly highlighting what it does is uh, you're describing your entire flow in a DSL, uh, and that DSL gets updated. Uh, we've just updated it for Docker. Uh, you can do uh, a number of other things, uh, as in uh, if, if there is a failure, you can actually recover from a checkpointed location. So you don't have to go back in the beginning of your workflow. Uh, you can start at midpoint. Um, there is human interaction. So you can go all the way, and somebody can wait for uh, the ops guy to say, the bits look good. Can you press approve? And this can go into production. You can do all of that. And, and the last piece, what makes workflow interesting, is um, uh, my analogy for Jenkins is, uh, is a bazaar. I, I grew up in India, lots of bazaars, lots of different languages being spoken, lots of things being exchanged. So I, I, started, I started thinking of applications as the currency that gets exchanged between different groups. So in the past, um, you had the currency was your war file, and then there was a deployment descriptor that was handed off to the, uh, the QA team. They tried to mimic this, and then that deployment descriptor with some additional steps was given to the ops team. And uh, that's been the currency that's, that started you know, exchanging throughout, your, uh, uh, throughout th this bazaar. And, and with Docker, that currency is changing. Um, so a very quick overview on Docker. Uh, it's, it's, a container, uh, it's a container. Your application runs in it. So in, in addition to your application, uh, you are also defining the environment 
on how that application, uh, on what environment that runs, right? Um, and coming to think of it, it's, it's uh, somewhat of an anti-pattern to what I learned in Java EE, but you're now starting to bundle your application environment and describing that an application environment. So what this does is it changes the currency that's being exchanged between teams. So the dev team can hand this entire Docker file that describes everything about that app to the to QA person and the production person, and there's no guesses along the way, right? So um, I think that's what makes Jenkins powerful is it remains constant as there's this the storm of changes happening around it. You can keep doing what you were doing, except you're now interacting with these new paradigms that are coming in. So with that, um, we'll get into the uh, how do you build these pipelines with Kosuke. And there are two use cases that we are talking about, the CD pipelines and the isolation of teams. Right, OK, yeah. So, um, so in this demo setup, um, what I'm going to show you is the many of the Docker or Jenkins plugins that I talked about during the keynote. So mentally imagine yourself to be in this company, maybe in San Francisco, you drank the Kool-Aid of Docker. So um, all your application development is happening as a container. Now, your company has a platform team who is responsible for building the base image. Let's say it contains Tomcat with some customization that makes it work for your org. And then each of the application team, and let's say there are hundreds of those, are taking this base image, baking the application in it, creating an app container to be run in somewhere else. So, okay, good, yeah. So here I have a, uh, so this is my demo Jenkins instance that contains these images. And then this is the job that defines the base, base image build. So on GitHub, um, I have the source code of this guy. Uh, that's not here, sorry, here. Um, and then so all it does is basically building the base image. So it has a Docker file that starts from, from a, a specific base image. And um, it, I'm adding a customization, right? So that's what this guy does. And then so in terms of the job definition here, it's very easy, and I hope nobody talks to me over Skype. Um, the, you know, all I'm telling is, all right, so I want to build the, this job every time there's a change in the source code, and then this is where I'm checking out the source code from, which is a GitHub repository. And in terms of the build, you now all I'm doing is basically building a container. So here I use the Docker build and publish plugin. And then all it does is basically build that Docker file in the current directory and then push this image into the Docker Hub by using the credential that I've already configured. So, you know, there's a built-in uh, credential integration. So, you know, even if this build or to run on any of the slaves that I might have, it will be able to correctly inherit my uh, credential settings. Um, and then so that's it. So that's, it's a pretty easy job. Now, the other one, the second job, is the app building one. So this is the one that starts from the, you know, the base image and then build the web app, and then in this case, it's a Java web application, and then bake that to create a new container, and I'm driving this whole process from the workflow. So that source code is in here. You know, it's a basically just a plain vanilla, uh, the Maven, our application, the interesting bits is one in here. So this is where I define the CD pipeline of this guy that the workflow. So you know, I, I try to keep this as simple as possible. Now, the, the line two is basically saying, that's basically just telling Jenkins that, okay, we've now entered the build stage. And then in that stage, all I'm doing is to you know, check out the source code, do the Maven install, and then archive the raw file. So create the raw file into the Jenkins so that we can look at that. Now there's a surrounding block here. So we are, this is where it gets a little bit more interesting. So in many places that's using Docker, it's actually very common to create a container that captures the build environment. Because um, you know, you have to, sometimes you have to have right tools installed with some licenses. Sometimes you have some company-specific configuration. For example, in case of Maven, you might want to talk to your corporate internal repository. So all that stuff can be handled by some internal, like a platform expert, and then they can produce you an image. And then so as a user, as a busy product developer, all you have to do is to tell Jenkins that, okay, I want these things to be running inside that container. 
And then once the build is over, um, I'm now in the packaging stage and where I create the new Docker image. So this is where I use the Docker file to package up the WAR file into the new image and then push that into the Docker hub. And then finally, for the kick of it, I get to the deployment stage and then I just run the deployment script to basically have this web app running somewhere else. So, so, the, so that's the flow um, of in here. And then what I'm going to do is basically sort of, let's pretend that, um, all right, so this is going, uh, let's pretend here um, that um, I need to, a, um, so let's pretend here that there's a security vulnerability discovered in Tomcat um, that the platform guys have to fix. So um, as a platform guys, I basically tweak the configuration here. So let's say by tweaking the configuration, I'm going to um, the edit the server header. Uh, oops. I see. So let's say um, I'm going to change these two things into some another text here. And then I'm just going to make this changing live from the stage and then push this change. So now the jo job of the platform guy is done. I've successfully unleashed the, uh, the security vulnerability fix into uh, the rest of the world. So if I go come back to Jenkins, you'll see that this had started triggering the build of the base image. And then so now I think it's already getting to the point of pushing the new image and oh, it looks like it's already done. And then, um, I noticed, in the, I, it noticed that the app field needs to be triggered. Oh, I guess I, for, I forgot to uh, tell you how this guy is configured at all. Um, so here, um, here, so that the trick of this job is that the, you know, it wants to, um, in addition to wanting to, you know, trigger when the change happens to the source code, but I also want to re-trigger this field as soon as the base image changes. And then here, you know, I can basically tell Jenkins to like, make the workflow plugin and the Docker, the Docker have a notification plugin to talk to each other. And then so that, and I'm basically asking Jenkins to say, whatever are the image that I depend on, when they change, I want to trigger it. And I don't have to explicitly specify what those images are because the workflow, uh, the Docker workflow plugin and this plugin talks to each other. So they know exactly what images I'm depending on. Um, and then the rest of the configuration is really just telling Jenkins that where is my workflow script is, and that's it. So because of that, um, he was able to trigger the, um, trigger the uh, build of the app automatically and then get that change deployed. So um, if I'm, so this is the actual application, the glorious application that I'm running here, and then just to sort of, uh, I think it's for both. Just to prove that this, um, it, it has incorporated the change in the server header, uh, here it's got the new server header that I configured just as a change. So in this way, you can sort of compose a bigger chain, well, in terms of the freestyle project in this case, um, to create the CD pipeline. So um, quickly, I'm going to talk about some other aspects of Docker integration here, which is more about how we build, um, how you can use the Docker as a build environment. So in this guy, um, I'm, so let's imagine that this is, like a, this is a yet another completely different demo setup, like a, some other random project. And here, as, a, like, um, as I guess, as an administrator of Jenkins, you want to manage your build staves as containers. But you're doing it without, you know, you're productive or particularly not knowing anything. So in uh, this plugin, um, the Docker plugin, the original Docker plugin in the Jenkins uh, lets you do just that. So you can create the, basically the cloud configuration um, in Jenkins, kind of in the system configuration page at the very bottom of it. And then you, you know, you're basically telling uh, Jenkins where your Docker uh, server is uh, and various other coordinates and registering a particular Docker image as the build slave. And then I'm associating that with this label called standard. So as administrator doing this bit of, um, this bit of behind the scene work, um, the people doing, the, the product team people wouldn't have to know 
particularly anything that this build is happening. They just have to specify that the, you know, I'm going to run, I'm going to run this job on a particular slave called standard slave type. And then whatever the build, uh, build does is not particularly important, but the end result of it is that as soon as you schedule the build, um, Jenkins is going to talk to Docker to get the new build slave, um, and then you will be able to sort of uh, execute the build inside, and then the build slave gets thrown away at the end. So it always um, helps you keep, or here comes the new build slave. So it will always help you to keep your build environment clean. Um, oh, did it just disappear? Oh, I don't know what happened. It, it, it just have disappeared. So that's another way. Okay, here you came back up. Um, so in that way, you can have the build running um, in always clean and isolated environment, which is really useful. Now, here's another, yet another plugin. So this is another slightly different use case. Now you are a product team developer, and then you're frustrated with the slow Jenkins administrator because they are not installing the right tool when you need it. So you could also, in that case, you know, you can say, well, I, wanna, you know, I want to specify the build image that I'm going to run in. And then, so this is what the Docker custom build environment plugin does. And then this is a checkbox that it adds. So here, so this is an ordinary freestyle project. And I'm saying that, okay, please run my build inside this container. Yeah, the same build environment container that you saw in the workflow. And then, you know, exactly what we run inside is not particularly important, but here I just have some stuff just to prove you that this is running inside a container. So now if I do the build, it still run in a regular, in a build container, but um, when we look at what's inside, um, oh, it's not clicking for me. Um, when you click what's inside, I don't know what the, come on. Uh, all right, I don't know what, something went badly wrong with Chrome because it's not responding to my clicking. So I guess you just have to trust my word that, that well, we have slides for exactly that use yes, case. Yes, thank you. Yeah, so you will have to trust my word that this actually <laughs> does run inside the container. So, um, so that's that, and um, maybe you. Yeah. So that was basically the demo. Uh, okay. All right. So uh, I guess uh, the three use cases I, I just we just kept this around because if you go back and look at the slides, you can visualize what's happened. In the first use case, what happened was uh, there were notifications coming in from Docker Hub that triggered the particular uh, job, and that job was happened to be run, written in uh, Docker workflow DSL, and then you could push that image up to, uh, up to your company registry, and uh, you can push that. Uh, the QA and testing and staging can actually pick that job out. And there's that last bit there called Docker traceability that we didn't show. Oh, I'm sorry. But uh, what ends up happening is uh, when you deploy something with Docker, it tickles back Jenkins. And then Jenkins starts keeping the, you know, the fingerprint in, uh, in its database. So you can now, if there's something gone wrong in production, you can go back to the build and see that and see what's gone wrong. Uh, the, the green picture up there is a Cloud Bees plugin. We'll talk about that as we go along. Uh, the other use case uh, the f about the standardized build environments for was, was we saw that was where the ops person is trying to standardize that environment and he's using the Cloud Bees Jenkins operation center to push that configuration down to all masters and share that across. And the last use case where we ran into trouble was this case where the developer in the CDO organization wants to try out his own stack and wants to do that too often, what he can do is he can specify a Docker file in his source code repository, and uh, the custom build environment plugin will instantiate a, a container environment with that. So that's sort of the sum of all the stuff that we've been busy on on, on Docker side in the last few months. Uh, where we are trying to head to this is, uh, so this was announced today. Uh, what we like to do is replicate what we've done with Docker in the open source community with Kubernetes. Uh, just curious, how many here are actually looking at Kubernetes or evaluating Kubernetes? All right. Okay. Um, and uh, from a product perspective, what we would like to do is we are looking towards uh, building an ops dashboard within Jenkins' uh, uh, platform where you can pull the data and see you know, which builds correspond to what's been deployed. Uh, 
So with that out of the way, we've seen about uh, building CD pipelines. Uh, we'll get to the uh, stage where we start talking about how to run operations at scale. And this is where we start getting into CloudBees product. Um, so early next week, we'll be doing at uh, Juice uh, London, we'll actually be announcing the release of CloudBees Jenkins platform. And that platform is based on two products that we have today. And uh, uh, historically, we started off with a product called CloudBees Jenkins Enterprise, which has uh, a, you know, about 30 odd plugins or more than that now, uh, which do uh, numerous things. So for example, if you had uh, your Jenkins master running and you wanted high availability, um, you know, uh, there's a backup master that's waiting up for the primary to fail and kick in. So it's all about eliminating downtimes for your end users. Uh, so that's, that's part of CloudBees Jenkins Enterprise. Um, and then one of the other very popular ones is the role-based access control plugin, which is deeply integrated with the folders plugin in open source. So what happens as part of that is uh, you can now start thinking of your team as like it, the dev team has its own folder, the QA team has its own folder, and each of these has, have their own roles-based uh, permission set up. So you can segregate teams by roles, um, and you can do a, a lot more than that in that plugin. Uh, but that's not sort of the high level on there. And as uh, our customers started using this, and as uh, CI and CD started uh, coming in at scale in the organization, uh, people have started asking us about, how can I have a single pane to manage all the masters within my organization? So we introduced uh, uh, the CloudBees Jenkins Operations Center about two, two years back, I think. And uh, what it does is it lets you A, connect to all these masters. You can have like a centralized security with RBAC push down to each of these masters. So there's a single place where you manage all of this. And if you have uh, you know, slaves, you can actually share those slaves from the operations center across these masters. So you effectively end up having some sort of a global cloud with for your Jenkins that gets shared across all the masters. Um, so uh, again, that, that was released about two years back. And uh, so we've talked about that in the past. In the, in the last uh, seven or eight months, uh, the stuff that we've done, which we haven't talked about, is uh, uh, when we released workflow in open source, we released uh, something called workflow stage view in our product. And uh, you saw some of that in Kosuke's talk. He didn't talk about it. But what you see on the left-hand side here is uh, this, uh, think of this as your entire end-to-end -end organizational value stream that's been defined in workflow. So all the columns here actually represent a stage in your software delivery pipeline that's defined by a workflow script. And once you define that, we can actually pick that up. And uh, the first use case that, uh, that we do here is, as a developer, I would really like to know um, uh, how far did my commits go. So if you see the first uh, row here, you have like, you know, it stops after the third column. And what that tells the developer is there was something that has gone wrong, and at the third, uh, the third stage within workflow, something's gone wrong. So he needs to go in and look at that. So that's, that's one use case, and there are just tiny bitty, uh, itty bitty numbers on it. Uh, they're actually telling you, uh, how much time did per a particular stage take? And this becomes quite useful when you're sort of optimizing for you know, a global end-to-end -end pipeline across your organization. So as a, say, an, the engineering manager who's responding to the CEO on uh, how his pipelines are set up and how optimized are they, he can actually look into it and uh, figure out if particular stages are degrading over time. And that's the place where they start digging in and trying to figure out what's gone wrong. Uh, so that's, that's what we built in the product. And, and we've taken the analytics uh, story a little further. And what we do now is across your entire operation center cluster, you can st uh, we, we start pushing data up to the operation center. And then we have some dashboards that help you visualize sort of the performance of your uh, cluster, and you can actually drill down into the performance of individual clusters there. And uh, um, the other stuff that we let you do is uh, you can uh, look into the performance of your builds. If you're trying to figure out what kind of executors are being most often used across my cluster, you can start pulling that data out. Um, 
And all this data is actually being pushed to an Elasticsearch uh, engine. So if you want to kind of go beyond the, the dashboards that we build, you can actually build your own custom dashboards. So uh, that's what we've done with the, uh, uh, in, in our product. And uh, uh, as, we, as we release this, there are a, a new sets of use cases that became very interesting for end users. So uh, one of them is this ability to promote a job. So as people started using Operation Center and Masters Across, what we saw is, at least in the bigger organizations, is they bring in a, uh, they bring in a test master, connect that to the Operation Center, and they want to bring in jobs on that test master, make sure everything is right, and then promote that to a production master somewhere. So this use case actually makes, makes that happen easily. And uh, we had to do some nifty things here. So one is, uh, uh, within the cluster, you can actually, uh, it shows you a path browser to find the job on a different master elsewhere. And more importantly, it's uh, integrated with the role space access control. So if you wanted to push a job into a folder somewhere and you didn't have permissions to, you would not be able to go and override some things. So it kind of goes back to the theme of making operations at scale uh, much better. Um, and uh, the next big one that we've released is this cross-master job triggers within uh, Jenkins. So what this lets you do, uh, fairly uh, self-evident, is uh, you can call a job another another master, uh, but it's in the in the context of a Jenkins cluster. So you can easily you have the same path browserness in there, so you can easily call them out. Uh, but it kind of enables uh, two main use cases. So the first use case is. Uh, as people have started scaling out Jenkins, we, we've talked about scaling Jenkins out horizontally and not vertically. So the operation center product lets you do that. And uh, in this environment, when you are adding a new master, you're now adding a master for a team. So your QA team will have its master, your production team has its own master, and so on. And now uh, people want to, as you're building these cross-organizational pipelines, you want to trigger jobs across these pipelines, across the masters. So that's, that's the first use case. Uh, the second use case that it enables is, again, it's, it's going towards, uh, we don't want one huge master in ivory tower that we are all worried about breaking down. What we want to do is break it down into these small teams such that no team Im Im uh, impacts the other one. And in that environment, what people want to do is they want to break the master down, and some jobs land up here, some jobs land up there, and so they want, again, this ability to trigger jobs across masters. So those are the two things that you know, we've been working on in the last few minutes, apart from Docker. And uh, again, this is going to be available early next week. Uh, the last thing that we've done, and uh, this is an announcement that we do at Juice London, is announce, uh, we've actually bundled these two into uh, what we call the Cloud Beast Jenkins platform. And there were sort of many, um, um, uh, there was uh, sort of the background motivation on this is, as we built the enterprise, uh, of, uh, our operation center product, what we saw was like uh, two kinds of audiences out there. So the first audience is the guys who are operating things at scale. They want all the features that we've talked about. But there's another set of people who have very small teams and who care about developer productivity. And uh, they will get to the point where uh, they want the enterprise edition, maybe in six months, but they are not there today. Uh, so what we've done is we've launched uh, two editions of the product. And the team edition uh, product uh, what we are sort of, uh, we bundle Jenkins, you know, Cloud Beast Jenkins Enterprise and Operation Center in that, so teams can quickly start off and architect right from day one. And uh, as they grow, they can keep adding masters if they want to. Uh, uh, the other, uh, the next feature, and I was talking to someone at lunch who was actually asking me about this, the other feature that we've done is uh, we are releasing something called Solution Packs. So um, a product, as a product manager, people come to me and ask for some niche features that does not apply to a lot of people. Um, integration with Amazon Cloud is one of them. There are people who really, really care about it, but there are people who don't. So in the past, it was either you know, we push this down to everyone or, or we just ignore it. So what we've done is we have the ability to sort of allow add-on packs of you know, solutions on particular problem domains. And uh, we bundle that, and you get that as part of Enterprise Edition. 
So in the next couple of days, we are announcing the availability of the Amazon uh, Web Services Pack. So you can uh, spawn off uh, slaves on the Amazon Cloud, and this is using the Amazon EC2 plugin. But you can do that on the operations center, and you can bring that across all your masters in the organization. And we've also integrated with the Web Services CLI. So if you're building these CD pipelines and you want to call on some Amazon Web Services, you can do that through the CLI. So uh, kind of summing up uh, on the Cla uh, CloudBees Jenkins platform side of things, uh, what we've done here on the team edition side, you're getting some developer productivity stuff. So there's, uh, there, if you're using Git, there are a couple of plugins that we've built that we use uh, internally all the time. It's called the Validated Merge and, and GitHub plugin. And uh, uh, there's a number of you know, uh, roles-based access control features that are in. And uh, all the work that we've done with uh, Docker is available here as well. Um, just to clarify, Docker work is in open source, but uh, uh, we've added it here. On the enterprise side, you're getting some of the enterprise features that I talked about, high availability. Uh, there's a feature that we introduced late uh, last year called cluster operations. That's pretty nifty. So now think about you as an administrator managing, say, a dozen masters, and you want to push down uh, uh, security updates or plugin updates across a cluster. You can actually have a job type that pushes that down for you down onto all masters. Um, there's another feature called Fast Archiver. So if you are running uh, uh, builds in a distributed network where slaves are somewhat far off from your master. Uh, this plugin actually speeds up the build by sort of doing some nifty compressions while transferring data. Uh, and the last bit on CloudBees Jenkins platform is as we built this out and as organizations have been rolling it out, we've had uh, feature requests coming in for integrations with some of the partners here, and some of the partners here have actually wanted us to provide Jenkins on their platform. So uh, last year, we talked about uh, CloudBees Jenkins Enterprise on Pivotal uh, Cloud Foundry pass. Um, now we announce uh, the availability of uh, our operation center product, and in the next uh, week or so, or two weeks, we are actually making the entire platform available on uh, the Pivotal framework. Uh, we are making the binaries uh, for Azure and Amazon available in their marketplaces, so you can actually just go down and install the product from there. And there's uh, uh, on, on the VMware side, we are actually working on how to use their Elastic uh, infrastructure to provide something like Amazon uh, uh, Elastic uh, slaves there. So again, a lot of things happening here. Uh, uh, I would. I would presume from a product perspective, there's, there's just uh, tons of more announcements coming down, uh, down this path as we go along. Uh, and now getting to the, I think, the most exciting part of the presentation here, uh, uh, let's talk about Tiger. So what we've seen so far is sort of bringing in, you know, operations at enterprise scale. And by that, I mean if you have like one operation center, you have, say, a couple of dozen masters, and you're rolling that out. But as CI and CD at scale gets adopted, that CEO now goes to the engineering manager, uh, not to the engineering manager, but gets to the CTO and says, like, how do I uh, bring CD to thousands of developers? And, and we've talked to customers who have, like, you know, 8,000 developers, and they want to enable CD for them, right? Uh, and in this case, the, and the challenges become quite interesting, right? It's no longer about a dozen masters or so. It's more. Uh, and then you get into this environment where uh, uh, how, how do I separate the roles between the admins, the dev team, or dev tools organizations that's managing them versus uh, uh, somebody else, uh, the, the team that's actually using it. So at this point, I will give it to Kosuke, who will actually walk through all the features. And we are likely to go good. five minutes over. All so. right, good. Um, so yeah, so this is the, event, the project that I've been spending a lot of time on in the past. Um, you know, so in these large enterprises, there's a growing interest in you know, creating Jenkins and operating Jenkins at the scale. So in these places, there's a clear lower separation between the product developer, so it's just going to use it, use Jenkins. And then there's an administrator that manages this infrastructure. And then there's usually some degree of control needs to be retained for the central guys, but also they want to remain, like, you know, provide some degree of autonomy for individual product teams. Um, and then in general, like it's expected to run this kind of scale with like a very small number of people. So 
we started seeing a lot of people, a lot of companies are interested in building this Jenkins sort of service internally. You know, there's some kind of self-service provisioning experience for developers so that they can create their own new master. And they can customize the out-of-box experience of the new master so that it already has the right setup, right plugins installed out of the box so that the people can, you know, hit the ground running. Um, and then the whole thing, again, there's a central management provided on top of it to make sure um, the, you can have a small number of people operating on it. And for us, this is like, uh, it's great because we already have technology. Uh, we have this uh, service we are running called Debug Cloud you know, on, public, uh, on public internet, and we are running more than 1,000 masters at any given time. Both the masters and slaves are elastic, so it comes from the same big pool, but uh, your build would start instantaneously on isolated build slave, um, and it has an you know, out-of-the-box customized experience to integrate with all these partners. So the idea is, okay, we have most of the technology, so let's take this technology and make sure that it runs on-prem. So that's where we started working on Tiger and how it was born. So you know, this is a package software that you know, we give to you, and then you can operate it as if it's a service. And then because this is a package software, we spent a lot of effort making sure that it's very easy to ramp up this kind of you know, non-trivial environment on large number of boxes the masters and slaves are both elastic and multi-tenanted, so you can use a single box to run lots of masters and lots of build slaves on it. And then it leverages all the goodies of CrowdBits Thinking's platform that Hapreet just talked about, so that you, know, you can provide centralized management, analytics of all the masters, you know, triggering jobs across different masters, all that functionality makes really sense in this environment as well. Now, the, because there are so many clouds out there, the idea here is that if we want to make sure that this uh, product runs on a wide variety of different environments, but we have to start from somewhere. So in the initial release, we are aiming for the Amazon Web Services and OpenStack. And then the idea is that the rest of the platform would fall, uh, follow relatively quickly. Now, so from the infra point of view, you know, this is how it's going to look like. You need a number of relatively static, the big honking boxes where the, you know, the masters and slaves are run inside the isolated containers. And on the front end, we need to have the HTTP reverse proxy to direct the traffic into the right backend. And on the backend side, we also need a storage to make to persist all the Jenkins home content. So it's at this point when I'm going to try to show you. Um, it looks like the, yes, the Chrome had crashed, so this is going to be a little bit tricky. Oh, good, okay. I think it's back. So, uh, so this is what the, uh, so I have this, like, uh, my own deployment of Tiger running on AWS. And then this is the, uh, the Jenkins operations, a cloud with Jenkins operations center where people can come in and they create a new master. So, you know, what I'm going to do is the, um, I'm going to create a new master named Golf. Um, and then I pick the right, you know, I, I ask to create a new master. And then you can obviously do this from the uh, API call as well. And then behind the scene, so this started provisioning a new master on this environment. So um, while it's doing it, so what's going on here is that the behind the scene, this like, uh, software has a number of boxes under its wings. So in this demo, I have three. So it's looking for one of the least loaded, build, uh, least loaded boxes and launching a new container that has the Jenkins master in it. You know, make sure that the new persistent storage for that guy is allocated in the backend storage. You know, make sure that the front-end reverse proxy is, um, is you know, directing the traffic to the right backend. You know, the connecting up the newly launched master to the, you know, CJOC. All that stuff happens behind the scene while I'm on the podium waving my hands. So, the, oh, oh, um, so hopefully, oh, if, if this guy is cooperating, I don't know what's going on here. Oh. oh. That's not what I'm supposed to be doing. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, and now you know my dirty secret that I'm running a certain operating system that I shouldn't be running anymore. <laughs> um, the, uh, but let's see. Yes, so what I'm trying to, I don't know what's going on. I'm you trying to switch to my browser, but yeah, it's not doing that. Huh? Yeah, it's not doing it. Um, come on, you can do it. So, 
So there was a part in the demo where he was going to actually uh, kill one of the masters. So I think that's manifested itself earlier by killing the whole demo. <laughs> Note to self, don't kill stuff in demos. Oh, oh, I know, I know. I think I know what's going on. Or maybe I don't. Oh, yeah, yeah, there you go. OK, here. Uh, that took a while to recover. And I think I'm. So now, the, while, while, I guess while I was struggling with demo, um, the, the, you know, the tiger has managed to create a new master. And it's ready to do the build here. So you know, at this point, it's just a fresh new Jenkins master. Not much happening, except it's already pre-configured to, you know, to do the build with the cloud build slave. So what I'm going to do is to just to prove that this guy is working, I'm going to quickly create some jobs um, and then specify that, um, uh, specify that this is, um, in fact, capable of providing the build slaves uh, from, the, from, the, from the cloud. And the build slaves themselves are uh, on containerized, right? Yeah, the yeah. build slave itself is containerized, and then so I can run the... Um, Let's say A three ten. You need to choose the not on master. Uh, yes, and then you know, I just I just make sure to prove the point that I'm running the build not on master. So um, as I schedule the build, this is going to start asking Tiger that I need a new build slave, and it's going to you know find again available build machine, available big honking box to run the slave container on. And it's going to do the uh, start doing the build. So I think as we are talking, this should be getting a new build slave going. And then now, yes, now it's underway. And then so um, there you go. So it's running in the container. Um, that's some like god awful name um, containers, but that's the that's what's going on. And then so what's the time now? Let's see. Do I have the time to do the failover? It's a Jenkins user conference. You have all the time. Okay. Come on. All right. <laughs> so I guess I'm going to write Bruce through it. Um, so, okay. So what the so uh, so the next thing that I wanted to show uh, was you know I wanted to simulate what happens when I make the when I make the um, the build. I'm sorry. I make the Jenkins master fail. So um, the so because in this, you know, the, I don't know how to, because Jenkins is so stable, I don't know how to kill it. So um, the, I'm going to just you know, connect to this worker node directly and then basically do the kill command, you know, kill nine to zap the whole thing in one go. So um, I got the three worker, three big honking boxes here, so I need to kind of have to find where the right guy is. Uh, let's see, I think this is this. I think this guy. Just to be clear, you don't have to do yeah, this when you're running this. You don't do it on your production environment because you're killing your master, but hey. Um, so I'm just going to, um, to issue a kill command to get this master, you know, basically disappeared. So if I quickly come back while this guy is still loading, um, now the, um, the connection to this master is, is fading because, well, I just killed it. But the tiger has also took notice that, oh, the master that I'm supposed to be running here is now gone. Well, something bad must have happened, so we need to find another place to run it, make sure that the storage is available on that other guy, and then you know, launch the new container that points to it. So the end result is it sort of acts as a kind of fade over layer. Right? So in this environment, you have a lot of masters you know, for each team, and it's uh, running on lots of big honking boxes. So even if one of them fails, or even if you lose the entire big honking box, the cluster will make sure that these master gets relaunched in elsewhere available in the cloud. So as a whole, the service level as the entirety of the environment, you can, you can kind of keep it up and running all the time, even if temporarily individual master might be affected. So now the idea is that if I just reload the page, um, we should start, uh, we should see this guy getting new provision in another place. Um, and then, um, yeah, so now it's starting to get back to work. And I just, depending on how much this guy is loaded, um, so yeah, so now it's back with all the jobs configured and the build state intact. So, you know, it, again, as an operator of this environment, you don't have to worry about it. If you had a workflow job, it would resume. Yeah, there. If, you, if, if you have a workflow job, it's even, wait, I haven't tested it, so I probably shouldn't tell you Consider that. Consider that yeah. as part of product <laughs> requirement. So, um, um, so it should, uh, so that should have worked as well. 
Okay, so now the, the trick is if I can get just if I can just get back to the right slides, then everything oh this is gonna take forever. So if I can just get back to the right slides, I can finish up the rest of the story really quickly. So um, so this is uh, the you know, still work in progress software, but we've came a long way. So I did want to make sure, um, if you're interested, we are looking for a few people who are willing to seriously kick the tire and work with us to drive this product to version one at all. So if you're interested in being part of that, then please uh, drop by at the Cloud Beast booth and uh, you know, we'd love to talk to you. I mentioned during the keynote, we are looking for the evangelists that interface with the community, but the Clabbies is also looking for you know, the evangelist that talks about more Clabbies stuff, as well as the product managers, the engineers, the sales guys, basically like everyone. So if you're interested in working with us, I'd be delighted and you should talk to us. Now, so just to wrap up the whole thing, you know, with the, with the recent advancement in the workflow and Docker, you can really build the modern CD pipeline with Jenkins. And then, um, you can bring the, uh, the, you can use the CloudBees Jenkins platform to bring this kind of container stable experience to both, you know, the team size organization and enterprise scale organization as well. And then finally, looking forward, you know, we are working on the new product called Tiger, which is help really the larger environment, larger organization to run a massive Jenkins sort of service inside their company in self-provisioning way. Okay, so sorry about uh, running over the time, but that's basically it for what we wanted to talk about. Thank, Thank you. you.